Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Patrick Liu and I'm going to be your host for the Diabetes Survival Guide show. I'm the founder of the Diabetes Management Group where I am a fitness and wellness coach for people with type 2 diabetes and pre-diabetes. And this show will be a way to share the phenomenal stories about people with all forms of diabetes, healthcare professionals who work with people with diabetes, health and wellness coaches who work with people in this population and or caregivers and relatives with people with diabetes across the world. A little bit of a personal background uh, for me as a show starter is I was diagnosed with pre-diabetes back in 2021 and made some modifications to my lifestyle and habits to successfully reverse it in 2022. However, that onset of me receiving pre-diabetes in 2021 triggered my memories of when my grandpa who passed away when i was a sophomore in high school from kidney failure secondary to his type 2 diabetes about the care that was misunderstood and not the greatest at that time so i want to provide this show as a way to explore the different spectrums of diabetes and healthcare professionals sharing their tips of what they've seen helpful in working with folks with them and then some things that weren't as helpful so that y'all can learn something. So thank you so much and we'll get started with the disclaimers and the show. Disclaimers. This show is not medical advice or a treatment plan and may contain sensitive and explicit content. It is intended for general education and demonstration purposes only. This content should not be used to self-diagnose or self-treat any health, medical, or physical conditions. Don't use this show to avoid going to your own healthcare professional or to replace the advice they give you. Consult with your healthcare provider before attempting anything you learned in this show. You agreed to identify and hold harmless the creators of this material for any and all losses, injury, or damages resulting from any and all claims that arise from your use or misuse of this show material. The creators and guests of this show make no representations about the accuracy or suitability of this content. Use these materials at your sole risk. Views and opinions are individual to the creators and guests of this show and do not represent any other opinions or entities and are not intended to event anybody. We hope you enjoy the show. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Welcome to the Diabetes Survival Guide show. I'm your host, Patrick Liu. I'm a student physical therapist and currently working on my nutrition coaching certification through Precision Nutrition. I am joined today by the wonderful and awesome Dr. Michelle Jamin. I would like to say that she has been a phenomenal mentor to me and learning more about how to work with people with diabetes who have had an amputation. And she is currently serving as a owner of the Align Rehab Physical Therapy, where it works specifically with people with amputations. She also serves as the Vice President of the Orthotic and Prosthetic Activities Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that provides adaptive sports and physical fitness to those with mobility deficits. And she is a huge champion and ally to those in the disabilities community and constantly advocates for them in legislative issues to make sure that we bring the American Disabilities Act standards to everyone in the community. And I always get chills seeing what she posts on her Instagram page okay. and everywhere else. So definitely check her out afterwards and I'll put some descriptions below. And with that being said, let's start things off. Michelle, feel free to share a little bit about yourself and how you got started working with people who have diabetes and has had an amputation and anything that I missed from your awesome bio. Thank you for listening. This is my first recorded podcast, so Ooh. I hope that I can set the bar high. But yeah, so thank you, Patrick, so much for having me. Thank you for what you're doing for the uh, individuals with diabetes. I mean, it's, it is a diagnosis that can be so detrimental, and I think we just don't have much awareness on really what can come from it. So I think 
the education you're providing to people is fantastic. My name is Michelle Jamin. I am the owner of Align Rehabilitation. I have two offices right now. One is in Abingdon, Maryland, and one is in Newark, Delaware, soon to be Wilmington, Delaware. And I, yeah, and I treat solely the limb loss population. I'm like one of those, I'm definitely a unicorn in that I have known what I've wanted to do since the fourth grade. So I have known I wanted to work with individuals with amputation since about 2004. My uncle had gone back to war after 9-11 had happened and he was serving in Operation Iraqi Freedom. So the news was always on in my house, just kind of following the war. We're just always making sure, you know, I never saw Uncle Vinny on the TV. Uncle Vinny is thriving. He lives out in California with his beautiful wife, my aunt. They run a Fleet Feet running store. They are doing fantastic. But I would always see our soldiers rehabbing at Walter Reed. And just seeing the technology that was put on them, and they were able to walk again. And I just said, oh my gosh, that's what I'm going to do. I want to teach people how to walk again. So I really focused all of my training, any type of volunteer work in undergrad, University of Maryland, I was able to observe at Walter Reed. And I did a lot of hands-on stuff through nonprofits and, and shadowing with prosthetists in grad school. And I found out that it's not all war vets that have amputations. And I get this question all the time now that's, oh, Michelle, like, oh my gosh, you must work with all of our vets. I'm like, oh, yes, I work with a lot of our veterans, but not our trauma veterans. I work with veterans who have had an amputation likely due to diabetes and complications with vascular disease. It's about 54% of patients with amputations come from vascular disease. About two thirds of those, like 54% have diabetes as a comorbidity. So yeah, I kind of rerouted my focus of, oh, I'm going to be an army PT to, no, I'm going to be an amputee PT and work with the general civilian community who is at really high risk. And then, yeah, one thing, my, my path's been like boom, kind of like a, what's that old, the ping ball machine. Yeah, and, pinball. And here I am. <laughs> here I am now, a line rehab. My celebration of my first patient will be May 5th. What? Um, no way. That's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Looking forward to celebrating that one year mark. And yeah, just that's where I'm at. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, especially with the journey that you've had from a personal story with your uncle who's now living in sunny California. and my aunts are actually currently living there right now, and my mom's actually from Orange County area, so we have some sort of yeah, Laguna Niguel is oh, there. Really? So tell her to go buy sneakers. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> and then other cool things too is that you took that passion of like, hey, going from an army PT to really specializing in working with folks with amputations, and also giving us some knowledge that like about half the people who have like type 2 diabetes can develop into getting an amputation, which is pretty serious because now that we know that severity, we definitely like to know more about like what has been your best success story with someone who's had an amputation and with type 2 diabetes. So I would say it's difficult to be like, oh my gosh, we dropped their A1C from eight and a half to seven. Mm -hmm. In an outpatient world, unfortunately, like we don't get those four or six months of treatment to be able to truly track A1C. But I think being able to educate patients, give a five minute spiel on managing diabetes through diet, exercise, just making healthy choices and then being able to recite that back to you and actually demonstrate they're they're doing it and implementing the change, I think that's probably the most success that I could get at this moment. Because when they come to you and they've had their amputation associated with the diabetes, a lot of times I find they don't really understand how their diabetes got them to this point. It's more of, well, I had this cut on my foot and then suddenly it was black. So 
kind of educating, you know, what happened through diabetes that led to you having, you know, neuropathy in the foot. So now you can't feel anything in that foot and you don't know that you stepped on a little pebble or that you wore those new sneakers and you got this little friction burn and being able to educate them on really what happened and preventing that happening from on um, the other limb. So yeah, I would say just being able to educate and have patients truly recognize the importance of managing their diabetes, not only through insulin, but making actual changes to their lifestyle has been most impactful, I'd say. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing, especially taking that as an approach of every factor goes into it and especially connecting the dots where, oh, I didn't know that my tingling sensation in my foot could have been correlated with my prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, and then it could severely get worse. So of course, check your feet. Everyone, if you have that opportunity, everything, take off those socks, check those feet just to make sure that you don't have any of those small cuts, which then turns black as Michelle talked about. Like That's the last thing we want. So prevention is the best way to go about it. Hey everyone, thank you so much for tuning into this podcast. And before we continue with the rest of this show, I wanted to let y'all know, please feel free to give this podcast a five-star rating. If you like it, share it with other folks that you think it'd be beneficial for. And if you haven't already, feel free to subscribe and follow to the Diabetes Management Group for awesome tips to manage your type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes. And let's get back to the show. Since you are a physical therapist and you are a huge proponent of getting out there and doing physical activity. So if someone were to like come in and they've never found exercise interesting at all, what are some things that you would recommend they start doing if they had a recent amputation, was sedentary beforehand, but now they're like, I don't know what to do from here on out. And how would you go about that education process and inspiring them to take control of their life again? I will typically ask, what did you like to do prior to your amputation? And then a lot of times I'll get the, well, you know, I was in so much pain that I really wasn't doing anything. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. So circle back, pre, pre-ischemia, come on. What did you like to do? Oh, well, you know, I really liked to garden or I loved working on my car. I love being able to wash my car, keep it clean, cleaning the pool, like little things like that. And I'll pick that apart and you can make that into functional exercise. So just trying to identify activities that will inspire people to get back to. I mean, we have to find something that externally motivates us to be mobile because if not, they really just revert back to that sedentary lifestyle. So I'm like a big fan of support groups. There was a amputee walking school was just at University of Maryland Rehab and Orthopedic Institute. And that kind of brings together a group of amputees just to do just some generalized fitness. We need to also show people that if you used to love to go to the gym, you can still go to the gym. There's no reason like everything can be modified and adapted to your level. And I think a lot of people fear like they can't go back to the gym because what are they going to do? I only have one leg. Well, you can do everything with one leg. We just need to figure out how to do it now. And really, as far as like just gentle beginning exercises, sit to stands. I love sit to stands. Sit in your leg, <laughs> boy, and sit and stand for 30 seconds count how many sit to stands you did in that 30 seconds and you're going to beat that next week you're going to put five more i love sit to stands i make all caregivers do the sit to stand challenge with me and then yeah if anyone has like exercise equipment in the home i'll help kind of create a home exercise program for them there if people are unable to ambulate they don't have their prosthesis yet i'm big into having my patients go to a strip mall before like opening hours or go to the high school track and just push the wheelchair just get some cardio in i mean you could do some foot propulsion right get your leg working so yeah those are my initial go-tos 
Oh, thanks for sharing that too. And I think the thing that really resonates as well, especially for folks who may not enjoy physical activity, but they really love gardening, like learning how we can modify an activity so that they can get back into gardening again, or whenever it's going to the gym and they're fearful, I can't go to the gym now, but then changing that mindset of, no, you can go back to the gym. We just got to figure out how we can return back to it in a safe way, learning how to do it appropriately so that you can do what you love, have those gains. If you put on five plates for doing a bench press, go for that five plates of a bench press, which would be super impressive for somebody. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> One day. One day. Have you ever watched like the Magic School Bus back in the day? Yes. And you know Miss Frizzle? Everyone knows Miss Frizzle. And you know how she was able to bench press with like five plates on the side for the, one of those episodes? Like Elizabeth. busted out like I think 10, 15 reps like it was nothing, like it was a world <laughs> set. I think everyone should aspire to become Miss Frizzle in that situation. <laughs> we can aspire. Yeah. All right. Again, everyone. Not medical advice. This is just some awesome opportunities that Michelle has shared. And if you want to become like Miss Frizzle, feel free to hit Dr. Michelle up. She could probably help you out to figure out your goals to get to that point. <laughs> All right. So moving on to the next portion, what would you say has been the most painful lesson that you've learned throughout your journey working with this population? And what did you learn from it? I wouldn't necessarily call it a bad outcome. The worst thing that's happened, but not being able to get someone to the level that they expect themselves to. You know, we get into this profession, like we want to help people. We want to make people better. We want to make people better than they were before surgery. You know, sometimes that's just not the reality, right? If we have to look at a person as a whole and for my patients that have had amputations, you know, there's so many comorbidities that go along with that, like COPD, you know, congestive heart failure, other vascular deficiencies that for five years, they've been immobile, sitting in their chair, haven't been able to walk. So to tell them, yeah, like you're going to get up and you're not going to need an assisted device one day, you know, that's just setting false expectations. So I think when I started, you know, I was more of a very like, oh yeah, we'll definitely like, we can get you there. We can get you there, but we might not. So I think what I learned from that is, is the importance of setting expectations. So I really take a thorough history and, you know, if I hear they've been sedentary for five years and they used to use a walker, you know, that's where I'll start. I'll say, I can get you to be functional in your house again with that walker can we maybe depending on how you progress you know get you down to two crutches get you down to a cane we can work towards that but i don't really set absolutes anymore because i think yeah you have to set expectations straight and one of the biggest things that i find as far as expectations come is the patients, you know, they're in the hospital, they some watch YouTube and they see these young individuals who are super high functioning with their prostheses, just dominating life. And they think they're going to put their prosthesis on and they're going to look just like that. Whoa. They don't see what those individuals went through on day one or day mm -hmm. zero, you know, they didn't just put the prosthesis on and go. Hard work had to be put into that and complications can come about, you know, you can get a non-healing wound. You could have to have a revision surgery. And yeah, I would say just not over-promising anything is something I've learned and not sugarcoating anything. That was also something I would try to do just you know it's like a nice coping thing to help people with to so say no like don't worry about that I've stopped that because that just sets a mentality of false expectations and that's not healthy for people I love hearing that setting the clear expectations and making sure that it's set earlier on and also looking at the individual as a whole because after all, it's like everyone comes in, they all start from different backgrounds. Like not everyone's going to come in and they're an Olympic athlete ready to jump on, try their blades and win the world records and medals. And so it's like, no, we got to look at where did you start from? And then 
how can we get you to the point where we can get you adapted to your new prosthesis and utilizing how you can learn how to use your new ablatory devices like crutches and a walker because after all you have a new limb now and your sensations not going to be the same as it was before so now you just have to learn how to navigate everything and understand what that is and going through with that so it's very powerful and i think hearing that has been really it, it's even impactful for me like i hear the stuff all the time in physical therapy school especially with the sit to stands one of my professors it's her favorite exercise and it's, yeah, it's, it's the best like very functional it's like power you know. it's balance right it's transitions it's working the vestibular system yeah. i love sit to stands <laughs> it's great like if you want to get off the couch so that you can go to the kitchen then there you go. If you need to get up from the toilet seat so that you can get out and go on your walk and everything, like, there you go. It's, you use it everywhere. <laughs> the best. <laughs> and it's just great just being able to hear that there is hope and there's also reality, but those two can be present together at that same time. And I guess moving forward to more of like the positive notes and everything, what would be one piece of advice that you would share with someone who has had an amputation, and then one piece of advice for someone with diabetes who doesn't have an amputation. So someone who had an amputation because of diabetes? Yes. Uh -huh. Number one is just because your leg is gone, your diabetes is not gone. The doctors, the surgeons did their job to stabilize you, to remove that infection, whatever was happening, that was a result of, of a poorly vascularized limb, but the rest of your body, it, you still have it. So what we need to do is prevent a second amputation on your side, on the side that was amputated. So if we're below knee, we don't want to become an above knee amputation or an above knee amputee individual with an above knee amputation. But we really need to also protect your anatomical leg so that's going to be your skin checks, your exercise, your diet, using like following your insulin. And that's always, yeah, I mean, that that has to be preached. I think I'm blanking on the statistic, but I think it's like, I think within two to five years, an individual will have their second amputation if, it, if they started as a vascular amputation. So that's a pretty alarming statistic for sure. And then for someone who has diabetes, but has not had an amputation, you said it earlier, is the foot exam. Check <laughs> your feet every day, a couple times a day. If you get new shoes, check them even more. No lotion in between the toes. That's oddly one thing I say all the time. And one time a patient came in and he was like, Michelle, I put lotion on my feet today because he's caring for his feet. They were very calloused. And he looks at me and he's like, no lotion between the toes. <laughs> and that was a victory. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. <laughs> because he had came in one day and his feet were just saturated. And the lotion, it sits right in between the toes. I'm like, oh, no, this is just asking for a little like skin maceration and a wound. <laughs> um, so yeah, I really preach the foot exams because it's preventable. And that's the wildest thing is the majority of amputations can be prevented. We just need to educate people on how can we prevent them. Oh, I love it. Check your feet and make sure that you understand that just because the limb has been amputated off that all the other things, like it's still there. We just have to make sure that we are diligent with it, but also understanding that we can still make those changes now because we're living today. The choices that we make today and tomorrow and then the next day just keep on doing those small little changes and live the best life that we can yeah yeah and then we got last question and then another like follow-up question so this is the fun question that i like to ask everyone who comes on here so what is your zombie apocalypse survival plan okay so you asked me this i thought so hard on this. I even put it into chat GPT. Oh, <laughs> me a little insight. I would probably go first. I would easily be bitten first. What? I, I don't think I would survive. <laughs> um, my survival skills are far and few. I do have my yellow belt, so maybe I could use that to my advantage, but I, I would 
hopefully I would be the one that would sneak off and find the antidote. And I'm blanking on the girl's name that had the antidote, but I would hope maybe that would be me. And then I would go and cure everyone since that's how I live my life is I just want to help everyone. So yeah, if I couldn't create the antidote, couldn't use my yellow belt in action, I would have the cool house of all the supplies, but that would yeah only last me so long. yeah And then I'm a goner. oh my goodness <laughs> okay i could respect that answer especially it's like all right you know you did your best to support everyone find the cure and going from there if not like i guess what did you have your yellow boat in Taekwondo. oh okay all right all right i mean that's pretty good <laughs> <laughs> it was an elective at University of Maryland. So to, to pass, you went from white to yellow. So yay. <laughs> all right it has been a pleasure having you on our show michelle so we appreciate your time and sharing your wisdoms of pearls with us how can people find you social media so will you i guess i don't even know what my i'll put that stuff down in the description y'all so... yeah i would say <laughs> social media my website align pt dash align rehab dash pt.com I'm, I'm very open. If there's any person out there that does have an amputation, you don't happen to live by me, that does not matter. My, my mission is to help educate and provide any resource that I can share. So yeah, emailing me, slide into my DMs. Um, Yeah. and yeah, really, I just, I'm here to help. <laughs> So no matter where you are. Michelle's Bye. really quick in answering in the DMs too, I will say. I posted like saying, hey, I love your stuff. And she's like, I love your stuff too. I'm like, oh my goodness, I, I feel so amazing. And then when I I know. ask her, it's like, hey. I'm always hashtag working. This is Yeah. what I'm, I'm working. <laughs> it's like, you're also the marketing team in addition to <laughs> being the owner of Align Rehab. <laughs> yeah, many hats. <laughs> all right <laughs> thank you all again for Thank you oh for yeah having me. no problem thank you again for joining us michelle and we'll see y'all in the next episode Can't wait.